I am here with Richard Rangham. Uh, sir, thank you very much for joining me today. You're welcome. Um, so you have a, a, a book, uh, your most recent book, The Goodness Paradox, and it's a fascinating book, and I highly recommend people read it. Um, but just to sort of set the basis for what we're going to talk about here, the, um, the paradox mentioned in the title, um, correct me if I'm wrong, is basically that we're slow to aggression in person, uh, but we have the organizational capability to carry out large scale violence. Um, is that kind of correct? Yeah, but that's kind of a, a sort of delicate way to put it, I suppose. Um, what I think of as a paradox is the fact that, uh, on the one hand, we are one of the most peaceful of animals. Uh, if you just measure it in terms of the frequency of uh, dyadic aggression, of personal aggression, um, whereas uh, people just move about their daily lives, uh, we are uh, remarkable for the low frequency of aggression compared to uh, the majority of animals. And, and yet at the same time, we are capable of uh, appalling violence, uh, which puts us right at the far end of, um, of what animals do in terms of killing each other. So the paradox is that we are on the one hand very unaggressive, and on the other hand, we're highly aggressive. And what does that mean? Right, and so w what is, in, in your book, you talk about uh, and again, uh, I'm going to pose this statement, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, elaborate on it. Uh, basically, there used to be um, alpha males that would monopolize the, all the women resources, and they were highly aggressive in person. Um, and this became a problem. So I guess the more organized, uh, less aggressive so-called beta males were able to team up together to overthrow these uh, these alphas and install a gentler society. But that that process for organizing amongst themselves also enabled people to be more violent on a large scale. Is that correct? Well, uh, it has all sorts of elements of correctness and... Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure I exactly agree with you that... No, 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 that's uh, fine, that's fine. <laughs> so, so the way you put it was that the capacity for violence is a consequence of the dynamic of the beta males uh, forming coalitions to be able to suppress the alpha male. I'm sure it helped, but at the, at the same time, I think that the capacity for organized violence uh, was there beforehand. Uh, and the reason I say that is that uh, we see it in chimpanzees uh, that uh, go out and, and uh, kill members of neighboring groups without uh, having gone through this process of uh, selecting for reduced reactive aggression. Um, so that probably was true in humans as well. But, uh, but the essential claim is right that, um, you know, obviously we don't have direct evidence that humans once had alpha males in which the uh, al most dominant male in a social group achieved his position through physical violence and uh, used it to claim resources, including mating rights uh, to um, many or all of the females. S sorry, to interrupt. So you, you said we don't have evidence for that? We don't have direct evidence. Okay. You know, we, we, we don't have a movie that go, takes us back right. half a million years. But what we do have is um, uh, very clear evidence from the primate world and from animals in general that you have alpha males uh, that achieve their position by dominating. And at some point, it sure seems as though in our ancestors, we would have had that same system. And in many ways, the question in my book, uh, or a question in the book is, when, when was that true? You know, was it true with with uh, uh, some species of Homo, was it species? Was it true with Australopithecines? Was it true only earlier? And and I conclude that it was true uh, up to about three hundred thousand years ago, on the basis of the anatomical changes that we see in particularly the males. So, uh, talk a little bit about those anatomical changes. What what 
evidence does that give for there being a shift away from this alpha male society? Well, the big story that is associated with Homo sapiens that is not associated, so far as we know, with any other species of Homo is craniofacial feminization. In other words, males getting faces that look more like females. Mm. Uh, so males uh, getting uh, narrower faces, uh, faces that had reduced brow ridges, uh, faces that were altogether bigger, uh, so altogether smaller. Um, and uh, the remarkable thing about this is the trend for males to become uh, less male-like and more female-like. And in animals, when we see that, it's associated with a reduction in male aggressiveness. And so it seems to me far and away the most reasonable thing to assume is that just as humans are now, rather low in the scale of this day-to-day -day reactive aggression, uh, then the time when they trend towards a reduction in that kind of aggressiveness happened was when we see uh, the reduction in maleness in the heads and faces. What's fascinating about what you're saying right now is that, uh, and uh, I, you, you do go to, uh, to some length to, to sort of inoculate uh, these claims from any uh, like political connotations, but there are a lot of people who are uh, super right wing who would look at that and be like, oh, well, you know, clearly nature is, is uh, on the side of the alpha males and our society has become more feminized and womanized. And uh, is, that, is that a concern you ever had uh, when you were writing this book? And does that at all, uh, I don't want to say impact your research, but is that something that's on your mind when you're, you're, you're discovering these things? Well, um, to write about uh, the evolution of aggression is something that is constantly nerve-wracking in the sense that uh, we know that um, people will use whatever means they can to support a particular viewpoint. And aggressiveness, of course, is something that is uh, politically and emotionally very salient. So, uh, so I'm always uh, careful about it. Um, and my aim is, uh, as you hinted, um, to try and be as objective as possible about the information and not to use it for straight political ends. You said, uh, was I worried that uh, <clears throat> people on the right wing would <clears throat> use the notion of a reduction in aggressiveness and a feminization of males? Uh, to their advantage, um, I'm sure they would, but so would people on the left wing. Right. Um, and, I, you know, in my mind, it's not really suitable for po the political um, discussion either way. You know, it doesn't particularly matter what happened 300,000 years ago. <laughs> uh, you know, what happens, what matters is what happens nowadays. But um, uh, at any rate, the, you know, the, the big point I would want to make, and, and I've always advocated for um, my co-workers and students and so on, uh, is that um, we take extra care to avoid uh, expressing the results of this sort of analysis in ways that could be misinterpreted. Definitely. Um, when, you, when you say the uh, feminization and, and also uh, there, there's kind of a correlation there with, um, with male maleness and violence. Um, like why, why are men in particular uh, so much more violent? Well, uh, as in uh, the majority of species, uh, of mammals at least, uh, males have been selected to uh, be good fighters because the best fighters are the ones that end up having um, the priority of access uh, to uh, female females for mating. You know, it's very crude, and we don't like to think about it that way uh, nowadays, um, quite rightly. But um, uh, it's clear that the fundamental dynamic is goes back to sexual selection theory, uh, which says that uh, the 
selective advantage, the evolutionary advantage, goes to the males who are able to impregnate, um, uh, well, who are able to achieve higher fitness for having more babies. And almost always this means, uh, until society intervenes, that um, a male does better by fighting other males in order to get access to many females. So there's been selective advantage in terms of males being good fighters in terms of their muscles and in terms of their minds, in terms of their skills. Okay, that I mean that makes sense. Um, I I suppose the the converse of that would be okay. Well, for females, is the reason then that those uh, like aggressiveness and violence is not as valued in, in terms of getting a mate. Uh, to put it in these um, biological or primitive ways, uh, is, is the reason that's not valued for females because they have to carry a baby for nine months in the case of humans? It, it, and why is that? You, you see what I'm saying? Well, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, there would be some advantage to females in being able to be good fighters, but the advantage is not very much. And there's going to be a trade off between uh, your ability to fight and your ability to escape fights and therefore survive better uh, by um, not having to get involved at all and not having a body that is adapted to uh, the stresses of fighting, um, be they for preparation or repair. So uh, just as in males, the advantages of fighting are sufficient that it is worth sacrificing some of your ability to survive, uh, so in females, the advantages to fighting are not sufficient, and therefore it's better to put um, effort, as it were, into long-term survival. So in every human society, um, males tend to die younger than females. And that's because uh, males have been adapted to being able to, to fight each other. Um, speaking of sufficient, uh, I, I wanted to talk about the like this this goodness paradox where um, this ability to not lash out with the sort of reactive aggression um, seems like it'd be necessary in order to be able to carry out uh, large scale organized forms of violence like you know genocides or war, um, but that it's not necessarily sufficient. Uh, in other words, like the ability not to fight each other in person all the time you, you have to have that to form a team but that doesn't seem like it's enough to um to have that sort of mass scale violence and also the the mass scale violence of like a, a holocaust or something like that seems much more remote for a lot of people and doesn't seem to tap into the sort of uh primal urges that hitting someone in the head with a rock does you see what I'm saying? Like Absolutely, yes. No, that's very true. And, uh, you know, um, I make a big point in this book of distinguishing between two types of aggression, reactive aggression and proactive aggression. And you've, you've mentioned those, hinted at them. And um, I think it's kind of fascinating that uh, although proactive aggression is in many ways uh, far more impactful in human society, it gets much less attention. Uh, so if you look up in textbooks of uh, human psychology um, or animal behavior, uh, you will see a lot of attention paid to reactive aggression, which is the aggression that happens when two individuals um, uh, meet. And in the case of animals, uh, I don't know, males fight over a female. In the case of humans, it might be um, men fighting over an insult at a bar. Uh, it might be uh, losing their temper on the football field. Um, but it's not what happens in war. In, in, in war, the aggression is almost entirely planned. And that, that planned aggression is, is proactive. And, and let me take this opportunity to mention that the solution, as I see it, to the goodness paradox is that we tend to think that aggression is one thing, but actually it is two things. So the goodness paradox says, uh, how come we are so nice in some ways, which is, we are very low in reactive aggression, our tendency to reactive aggression, but we're very nasty in other ways. And, and what that means is we're very high on the scale of proactive aggression. So the paradox is resolved by saying, well, it's not a paradox because uh, we've got two different things going on. 
One is reactive and one is proactive aggression. One, one were very low on the scale, the others very, were very high on the scale. Well, you know, once you appreciate that, then you think about the importance to our species of these two different um, qualities. And as I say, the textbooks and um, all sorts of discussion is dominated by our concerns uh, about an interest in reactive aggression. The, the type that is associated with um, passionate feelings, um, with uh, impulsive behavior uh, that is quite difficult to control when you get into uh, the fight. Uh, but, I'll, but the type that is totally predominant in war, which is such a defining feature of our species, is proactive aggression. Because proactive aggression is planned uh, and uh, war consists uh, very largely of a series of exchanges uh, that are planned. And very often they are asymmetric in which uh, a group from one side makes a deliberate effort to attack some unsuspecting people on the other side uh, and, and kill them. Now, uh, so this is this sort of odd contradiction, if you like, in humans that that we focus on reactive aggression as the biological part, which is what you were saying, and we tend not to think that the proactive aggression is part of our biology. And it was when, uh, in the 1970s, uh, the discovery of proactive aggression happened in chimpanzees in the wild, and then subsequently many forms of proactive aggression were found in different species, that we could start realizing that proactive aggression uh, in humans fits into a pattern that we see quite broadly in animals um, uh, in many different contexts. And therefore, from a biological perspective, uh, our proactive progression is simply an exaggeration of tendencies that are seen in other species. But because it's planned, because it's not associated with uh, immediate, impulsive, uh, emotional arousal, uh, you're right. A lot of people find it difficult to imagine as being part of our biology. What, what does that look like in the brain, um, this, this form of proactive aggression? Because I, I, can, I can picture, you know, adrenaline and fear centers lighting up when you're getting into a street fight. But if you're sitting in an air-conditioned building and piloting a drone that's 10,000 miles away and pressing a button that blows somebody up. If you read some of the transcripts, those people uh, w where they're talking, they're, they're not, they're very calm and collected, um, I guess, as you would expect, I suppose, uh, in this form of proactive aggression. But w what is, what are the biological mechanisms then that are taking place? Well, of course, um, it's very difficult to get at in humans. Um, because uh, what you want to do from a scientific perspective is experiments where you can um, put receiving devices, recording devices uh, on particular neurons or um, uh, nerve groups and, uh, and figure out what's going on when people are being uh, proactively aggressive. You can't do that. Uh, maybe one day the ability to record inside the brain uh, will improve. What you can do, I think is some very significant work has been done in rodents uh, that shows that uh, the uh, neural tracts that are activated when a, uh, a rat or a mouse is engaged in proactive aggression uh, are very close to, but are distinct from those that are involved in reactive aggression. So literally um, you can take uh, uh, three sort of core uh, units in the brain that are associated with aggressive behavior, uh, the periaqueductal gray, the amygdala, and the hypothalamus. And there are neural tracts that run between these. And um, uh, if you like, the, the different uh, wires that uh, are stimulated when reactive or proactive aggression occur are just adjacent to each other. And they're running between the same units, between the hypothalamus and the amygdala and the very abstract gray, but they're just different uh, tracks. Uh, so it's very likely that that's what's happening uh, partly in humans because um, 
from what we know about the way in which aggression is controlled in humans, uh, it's very similar to what it is in, in other mammals. So for instance, if you get a tumor uh, that affects a relevant uh, part of the reactive aggression system uh, in humans to judge from the rats, then it turns out that suddenly we got an excessively aggressive human. But, but relatively little is known about the proactive aggression because we've only just recently got models of proactive aggression from the point of view of studying the um, neural mechanisms in rodents. So I'm expecting that um, more will be discovered. Uh, people have got some ways of getting at uh, different parts of the forebrain by having these uh, transcranial stimulation methods that uh, can kind of turn off parts of the brain at, at some time and you can manipulate the degree to which people uh, are liable to proactive aggression uh, doing that. But we're still at a very early, early stage. Um, are we becoming less violent as a society? Well, um, I mean, that's a question for uh, Steve Pinker, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I'm totally uh, with Steve Pinker in uh, his analysis. You know, he reviewed uh, elegantly a lot of material and uh, showed very convincingly that uh, at all sorts of time scales in um, the last uh, few decades, few centuries, or even few millennia, uh, you can talk about uh, reductions in aggression in many different dimensions. So yes, you know, but I, ha I hasten to say that that's a pinker question because um, you know, I can't talk about that from an evolutionary perspective. From the evolutionary perspective, you've got to start thinking about um, tens of thousands of years, right? And and I'm sure that we are far less aggressive than uh, we were uh, a few tens of thousands of years ago. Whenever whenever you mention, I mean, we we are definitely on a long term trend of reduced aggression to judge from uh, our the changes in our anatomy. Um, well, okay. So I, I I get that you don't want to talk about it from. I mean, it's harder to talk about it from an evolutionary perspective. But my, my only thing with the, the Steven Pinker argument is the, the biggest eruption in, of violence in human history, which was World War II, uh, occurred like less than a century ago. And we, we invented the weapons that could potentially wipe out human civilization. So I think, I mean, I don't know. This is my naive opinion, but it seems... Like we've definitely along some metrics, like we're not uh, as reactive uh, in our aggression, but it it seems like we, we still, uh, I, I don't know. It, it feels like it depends a lot on what time scale you look at, right? Well, the reason for saying that uh, we are becoming less aggressive, even when you take account of the second world war and other outbursts of violence in the uh, 20th century is that if you tot up the numbers, uh, then you find that um, astonishingly, even uh, when you think about the number of Russians who died in the Second World War uh, and uh, the large numbers in um, Germany and, and Europe generally, uh, you still find that compared to the rates of death uh, in small-scale war, happening in small-scale societies, the actual rate of death is reduced. So, you know, you, you may have 20 million dead in the Second World War, but those, those 20 million uh, come out of a population of whatever it is, you know, 200 million. Uh, so what, what Pinker did was to uh, show very clearly what had actually already been demonstrated in a, a less public way by Lawrence Keeley, uh, who assembled the data on small scale societies and compared them to what you see in uh, relatively contemporary societies. And, um, you know, I, I always think about this in terms of a, a slide that I prepared on the basis of Keeley's work, which looks at the rates of death in uh, some 
30 small scale societies and uh, compares them with uh, rates of death in uh, Russia, uh, Germany, Japan, uh, France, and uh, one other which I can't remember right now, uh, during the 20th century, when uh, you know, the latter European countries and, and Russia were involved in the First War and the Second World War. And astonishingly, you know, their bars are much lower than the ones in small-scale societies. Because mm. it's a percentage. And the point is that in the small-scale societies, everybody was involved in war. Um, women were most often victims. Occasionally, they were involved actively. Um, men, uh, in, all men got involved. And that's just not true in um, something like the Second World War where you have a militarized group, you have the, the soldiers, and a lot of people stay home and hope to avoid the war and succeed in avoiding the war. So the mega death that we have become uh, you know, familiar with from history, a uh, recent history, uh, it's mega death uh, because we've got huge societies mm. and huge armies and huge systems of, of killing, as in the concentration camps. But the actual rate, the actual probability of dying during the 20th century uh, from violence was uh, something like a tenth. I can't remember exactly, but I mean, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big reduction compared to the chances of dying from violence in uh, small-scale societies from the data we have. Okay, that, that does make more sense. Um, do you think that there is any argument for uh, the idea that maybe as reactive aggression goes down, uh, uh, this, this non-reactive or proactive aggression, uh, it, it, I, don't, I don't know, goes up, if only to sort of sublimate the, uh, these reactive urges that we're not acting on? I don't, I don't see any relationship between them. I mean, it's, I suppose it's conceivable, but um, uh, in the, the parallels between intergroup violence in chimpanzees and intergroup violence in uh, small-scale human societies are pretty striking in the sense that in both cases, uh, the majority of interactions involve uh, small groups of adult males uh, deliberately attacking a lone uh, male in the neighboring group and uh, killing them and then um, running back to their own areas. Uh, it's not the only thing that happens in, um, in hunter-gatherer societies, uh, but it is one that happens uh, often, it's been described often, and uh, is very similar to what you see in chimpanzees. And I mention that because uh, to the extent that that is something that is characteristic of humans, uh, it is also characteristic of chimps, and yet chimps have not had any kind of reduction in reactive aggression. You know, they mm -hmm. are highly reactively aggressive. They lose their tempers at a moment's notice. Uh, and so the, the fact that the chimps are, are very high on the reactive scale, uh, whereas we're low, um, does not prevent them from being also high on the proactive scale. So I, I see these two things as largely independent. Okay. Um, we, speaking of chimps, w when you're studying chimps, do you ever uh, do you ever get like chills or get get worried about humanity? I mean, they're they are our, our closest relative, and they're pretty barbaric. I mean, there's a lot of murder and uh, rape and all kinds of awful behavior. And w when you see videos, at least videos I've seen of of chimps. Uh, you know, waging a battle or a raid, I guess you would call it, and killing another, a chimp from another tribe. And they, they seem like they're, they're loving it. They seem like they're really having a good time and excited about what's going on. Uh, does that, does that give you any pause as a human being? Yeah, no, it, uh, that's right. Um, you know, Jane Goodall is very good on, on this sort of question. Um, and uh, you know, she was directing the field site in Gombe uh, when um, people like myself were uh, out there and um, 
and making the observations of uh, the chimps doing this, this stuff. Um, and I, her response was that she had thought the chimps were just all you know, delightfully peaceful. And, and then when um, the discoveries mounted showing that actually it was a systematic uh, natural behavior of chimpanzees to, to go off and make these horrendous kills, then uh, she recognized that in some ways it just made them all the more human. Uh, so at an emotional level, it drew her in some ways closer to chimps. Um, but it also does do what you were saying, I think, which is to give one chills a little bit because it really emphasizes that uh, some of the things that we would most like to see abolished in humans, namely the tremendous tendencies for taking advantage of power to um, abuse other people, uh, those tendencies uh, are pretty deep in us. That is, that is chilling. There's no question about it. Um, speaking of those, those dark tendencies, uh, one of the darker among them, and you, you were an editor of a book called uh, like Sexual Coercion in Primates and Humans. What, what are, what, what's the evolutionary explanation for things like rape? Uh, by the way, you said that um, chimps are, are very nasty and include rape. They, they very rarely rape themselves deliberately. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, <laughs> deliberately. Very, very rarely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, deliberately, if you like, but um, they very rarely rape. Um, and the reason that chimps very rarely do it is because um, obviously it's a male behavior and um, the females uh, are interested in having uh, mate, being mated by almost every male on almost every occasion. Oh, wow. And there's a logic to that. And the logic is that uh, any female who has a baby and meets a male who could not possibly have fathered that baby uh, has to fear that male because he might kill the baby. And the reason he would want to kill the baby is because if it's not his, definitely not his, then the sooner she uh, is um, without a baby, then the sooner she will come uh, into heat again, into estrus, and uh, will be available for a male like him to uh, have a chance at mating her and conceiving with her. That means that it pays a female to mate all the males in her community sufficiently often one can imagine that all the males can remember having made it her. Oh and, my God. <laughs> and think that she is a possible uh, mother of his child. Wow. So that's, that's the logic. And that means that if a male wants to mate a female, it's not very often that she is going to resist. She might have some special reasons for it in terms of uh, the contemporary social dynamics, you know, for instance, she might see a more dominant male out of the corner of her eye and doesn't want to get into a fight when he tries to stop the, the male who's courting her. But in general, she's willing to mate any male. And in fact, she's very sexually active and does a lot of um, uh, invitation to males to mate. The one circumstance in which a female is most likely to get raped is when she is being courted by her brother mm. because uh, she seems to be more sensitive to the dangers of an in inbred mating than he is. And so the, the few cases of real rape where a male uh, tries to get a female to mate, she screams and tries to avoid him and he just comes charging after her and grabs her and and throws her around and beats her up and stomps on her until she agrees to do what he wants to do. That is mostly brothers attacking sisters. Wow. Well, that's a, that's a, a discourse on rape in chimpanzees. Yeah. Um, probably more than you wanted to hear, but- No, know, no, not at all. <laughs> um, was about um, uh, sexual coercion in general. Yes. And so, you know, it's interesting with chimpanzees because um, on the one hand, I've just been describing how it's in a 
females' interest to mate with males a lot. And you know, maybe on an average baby, uh, the female has mated several hundred times um, and uh, distributed those matings pretty evenly across all of the males in the group. Uh, so she, maybe she's mated 500 times, maybe a thousand times, and, uh, and each male will have had some tens of, of copulations. That's the sort of thing. Well, uh, that's the female's point of view. From the male's point of view, of course, what he wants is to have as many of those meanings as possible for himself, as opposed to sharing them with all these other lousy males. Uh, because uh, uh, the way evolution works is that uh, uh, favors behavior that leads to his genes being passed on to the next generation. So the, it's in the male's interest to stop other males from mating and therefore um, for the female to respond most quickly, most effectively, most willingly to him. And that's relevant particularly when the female is most sexually attractive, which is in the first, in the, uh, the, the, uh, the two or three days closest to when she ovulates, produces the egg. And during that time, all the males are around her like a honeypot. They just all want a piece of her. So she might have 50 copulations in a day. And during that time, uh, some males will get more copulations than expected by chance. Well, the males who do best in relationship to their own ability to fight other males are the ones who have been most coercive to that female in previous days, weeks, or even months. And that means, it means when we say he's been most coercive to her, that he has been physically aggressive to her, beating her up. So you see this very odd behavior where uh, a female who is not in estrus, a female who um, may be uh, weeks or months away from being in estrus, is all of a sudden, out of nowhere, attacked by some male. And this is, feels puzzling. And then what you see over time is that she will be particularly heavily attacked and frequently attacked by a particular male. So that male is her principal aggressor. Well, it turns out that her principal aggressor subsequently is um, the one who is uh, going to mate her more often than any other male does and is the one who is most likely to be the father of her baby. So that's how effective he is in coercing her into mating with him more often than she does with other males. And how exactly that happens, we haven't really parsed out. You know, is it because she mates the other males less or is it because she mates him more quickly and more um, readily when he is the one uh, doing the soliciting? Um, it's probably both of those things. It, do you think that's at all related to the phenomenon um, where women who are uh, domestically abused uh, stay with their partners? And, uh, you know, I, I, I know women who have been abused by their boyfriends and come up with all kinds of rationalizations for why to stay. And it's horrible. Um, but do you think that's at all uh, connected or is that a, a separate thing? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, obviously, one of the reasons that women don't leave the abusive men is because they're fearful. Yes. Um, and, and they've got reason to be fearful, be, uh, particularly in the cases where the men are proactively aggressive. The um, people who've studied sexual violence distinguish between men who are reactively aggressive and men who are proactively aggressive. And it's the proactively aggressive ones that turn into the stalkers uh, who will hunt down uh, a woman who has left them and, uh, and, and kill her. I mean, that, you know, we know that they get these horrendous stories all too often. Um, so, uh, you know, I can well see that part of the reason that she stays is for, uh, for fear of what happens if she leaves. But uh, yes, it's, it's intriguing and sort of, you know, rather daunting to think about the possibility that 
um, there is some kind of uh, evolutionarily selected dynamic by which um, women actually um, come to prefer their abusers at some dark, deep level. And the basis of that would presumably be something like that uh, even if he is abusive to her, uh, there is the benefit that uh, he is uh, protecting her from other men uh, and so she gets some sort of you know minor benefit in that way. I am not saying that I think that that's definitely an answer but I can see that you know, it's a conceivable dynamic to be thought about in humans. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you on that subject is I, uh, I'm, I'm friends with a, a bunch of uh, hippy dippy people and uh, they they seem to believe that uh, primates uh, um, or not not so much primates but humans in the far past uh, like hundreds of thousands of years ago uh, were almost entirely polyamorous that uh, monogamy was you know not uh, was no more of a thing than being a vegetarian was um, is that is that accurate in your estimate? I, I don't think it's something that you can strongly challenge either way. You, you, you can't say strongly that it definitely happened and, uh, or the strongly that it didn't happen. Um, the time when I think we'd be talking about this would be, um, uh, well, I don't even know, but, but uh, you know, if you, if you read the data as I do to say that uh, prior to 300,000 years ago, we had a primate-like system in which there was an alpha male who bullied his way to the top and then took advantage of being at the top by mating with as many females as possible. Um, it is still uh, possible that there were uh, a few other males in the group, uh, that it was vital for the females to be able to mate so that uh, they would not be aggressive to her babies, and infanticidal to her babies. You, know, you, could, you could argue that. So it's conceivable that, that uh, 300,000 years ago and more, uh, there was polyamory of the type that you would characterize uh, in, in chimpanzees. You know, the word polyamory means, um, refers to poly uh, many and amor love, right? And it occurs to me that even though polyamory is a way that you could describe the chimpanzee system, you wouldn't want to if you wanted to focus on the love aspect. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, this is sex at its rawest with absolutely no hint uh, of uh, long-term affection. Uh, so, you know, whether or not there was polyamory in the sense that uh, your friends would like it to right. be in which it was, um, you know, much more than just uh, raw uh, sex, which involved um, fairly brief copulations, averaging in chimpanzees something like eight seconds. Um, I, I, that that seems to me a harder ask. I see. W was there a specific time that we can trace back in, in human history to when monogamy uh, became more of a standard? No, uh, it's, it's, it's very much uh, a guess, I would say, at the moment. Okay. Um, you know, uh, I, in my book, um, I speak about the importance of language becoming so sophisticated by 300,000 years ago that um, people could form uh, rather sophisticated cons conspiracies based on talking to each other, sharing ideas. And prior to that, language would have existed in some form, but it would have been just a bit less delicate. The reason I mention language is because uh, I find it quite hard to imagine how you would get a human style of monogamy prior to the evolution of language. And the reason is that in uh, the way that hunters and gatherers get their food, men and women are separate during the day. And most readers of the fossil and archeological record agree that uh, the pattern of 
male foraging being more focused on um, uh, hunting uh, large animals uh, and the female uh, strategy of being more focused on uh, finding relatively predictable foods like roots and mollusks and that sort of thing. This seems likely to have been a, a very deep distinction that went back perhaps the whole the last two million years. That means that men and women were separate during the day and therefore it means that there were lots of opportunities uh, for cuckoldry. Uh, just as there are in our contemporary society today. And of course that leads to a lot of problems. You know, men and women come back and meet each other in the evening over the uh, evening meal or whatever it is. And uh, if um, a man is suspicious of his wife or if a woman is suspicious of her husband, then there's a row. And that makes every sense in terms of evolutionary biology. But it's difficult to understand how you could have had a system like this where each individual, male or female, would be interested in mate guarding, would be interested in making sure their spouse doesn't run off with somebody else if you don't have language, because you need language to be able to quiz your partner as to what happened and why. Without that, if the men go one way and the women go another, but not all in the same group, uh, that is to say not all the men in, in one single group and not all the women in, in, in their own group, then there's lots of opportunity during the day for people to meet up behind the bush. And so, that's why I think that monogamy is difficult to imagine until you have a system of absentee mate guarding. Mate guarding even in the absence of your own physical presence, which is achieved by quizzing witnesses, quizzing your partner, um, and so on. Wow. So for me, you know, I, I don't think that um, monogamy would really have been possible until uh, well, uh, the evolution of language, unless you have a, a totally different foraging system. And the primates, you know, bear, bear this up. Uh, so all the primates that are monogamous um, are, or any of the, you know, the monkeys and apes um, that are monogamous are um, uh, with each other all day. That makes sense. Um, that That's going to put a, a pin in a lot of people's bubbles. Um, but <laughs> that's, uh, I think that's a reasonable explanation. Uh, the, the last question I wanted to ask you, uh, before I let you go, um, you had also written a book called catching fire about how, uh, cooking, uh, food, uh, played a, a major role in the evolution of our brains. Um, and I was curious, ha have you heard at all about the theory, um, that, humans or that uh, uh, early hominids uh, ate uh, like psychedelic mushrooms and things like that. It's, it's referred to as the stoned ape theory. I was curious if, if this is taken seriously at all by, by reputable scientists. I have heard of it. Um, I read about it in Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind. Um, and I I followed it up enough to uh, to realize that uh, no, nobody takes it seriously, <laughs> is okay. the short answer. Um, it's an odd theory, and I don't even, I can't even remember exactly how the theory works um, as to you know, why supposedly taking psychedelic mushrooms would foster a more you know, development of a human brain or human ideas or, or what. The, the great difficulty, of course, about from thinking about this from an evolutionary perspective is that in general, individuals who take uh, psychoactive compounds that are psychedelic uh, are putting themselves in a more vulnerable position. And they're going to be vulnerable to predators, they're going to be vulnerable to, I don't know, brainstorms, uh, they're going to be vulnerable to uh, the, the rival who is wanting to take advantage of you. Yeah. So if you're living in, in the relatively tough natural world, to make yourself um, relatively immobile uh, and or uh, so fascinated by 
the colors on the back of an insect that uh, you don't notice the uh, approaching lion um, or you know other ways in which your mind is not well attuned to your environment is obviously maladaptive and I mentioned this partly because in Michael Pollan's book he says that uh, he cites somebody who says that a number of species of primates um, have been uh, suggested to, uh, to take psychedelic compounds from natural plants. And I wrote to him about that and said, uh, do you have any uh, follow-up citations for this? And it turns out that they basically do not appear to exist. Um, and uh, it's, it just seems that there's no evidence at all that any primates do this. So the stoned ape theory would have to be the stoned human theory, and I still don't buy it. So when you, uh, when you sent him that, that email, did he, um, did he just say, I'll get back to you, or did, w was he not able to produce any citations or any evidence supporting that claim? Well, I don't mean to dump on him because yeah, you know, I'm no. a huge admirer of him and so on, but, but it, it so happened that uh, this particular claim of, uh, of a number of primates, 21 or 22 primate species of primates uh, known to eat psychedelic mushrooms, did not have a citation, which you know, the great majority of the claims in his book did. So that's why I wrote to him to ask, and he said he couldn't remember, he'd get back to me, and then uh, he consulted with his fact, fact checker, and the fact checker uh, said she thought it was in such and such a book. Uh, and uh, I, I read uh, one of the books, which is called Intoxication by uh, uh, Ronald Siegel. And, uh, and that doesn't have any solid facts at all. Uh, it just has some, uh, some very loose anecdotes that you know, are totally unconvincing. Um, so that seems to be where that particular, let's call it rumor, stands. Interesting. Yeah, they a lot of publishing houses have sort of cut their budgets for things like fact checking and uh, editors, and that's that's really harmed uh, a lot of books. I mean, I love uh, the How to Change Your Mind. I think it's a great book, but uh, interesting to note. You know, it seems like there's always, even in the best books, like some error somewhere. Um, well, anyway, uh, on yeah. that note. Uh, Richard, thank you very much for your time. I enjoyed this chat. I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Great.